there's this comic, what's his name? They called him King of the One-Liners. He talked about drinking wine. He said, don't you know that's going to cause a hangover? And he said, yeah, at the end, but the beginning and middle are excellent. And so that's really the problem with hedonism, right, is that to pursue something that makes you happy in the immediate present risks sacrificing your, well, many things, but at least, let's say, your hedonism in the medium to long term. And of course, that is one of the major problems with drug use, and alcohol is a really good example of that, because whatever hedonic kick you might get from it that moment at night, you're going to pay for almost completely, or maybe even more so, because the next day you're much more jittery and anxious, and that's a that's a direct consequence of withdrawing from the drug. So when you're in, when you have a hangover, you're in alcohol withdrawal. So that's how fast you you get, roughly speaking, addicted to it. And so if you take another drink when you're hungover, it'll cure it. But it's not a very useful cure because all you do is push the inevitable hangover one more step into the future. And so part of the problem with the hedonic answer is happy when exactly and over what period of time and also who's happy because maybe something makes you happy but makes your family miserable now you could say well I don't care but you do care if you have to live with your family because they're going to take it out on you so so the the impulsive hedonism which is also fostered say by a positive emotion it, it tends to put people into a state of the pursuit of short-term hedonism it's not a good long-term or medium to long-term solution I actually think that's why people evolved conscientiousness, right? Because conscientiousness is not happy. Conscientious people aren't conscientious because it makes them happy. We're starting to think that they're conscientious because they actually feel terrible if they're just sitting around doing nothing. And so it's a way of staving off stress, the stress that's related to enforced leisure, something like that. You know, you, if you know industrious people, some of, you'll have, some of you are industrious, some of you will have industrious parents, they just can't sit around and do nothing, they have to be working. They don't feel good unless they're working. So, one thing about conscientiousness is that it, it involves continual sacrifice, right? You're doing difficult things in the present, hypothetically, to make the future better. But that's not driven by hedonism, by any stretch of the imagination. And conscientiousness is actually a pretty good predictor of long-term life success in stable societies. Because there's also no point in being conscientious and saving things up and storing things if a bunch of thugs are going to just come in randomly and, and take it all away. So conscientiousness actually only works intelligently in societies that have some medium to long term stability. You know, because you can get wiped out by hyperinflation too, because hyperinflation kills off the conscientious people. The people who accrue debts are thrilled when hyperinflation kicks in because it wipes out their debts. But of course those debts are the things they owe to people who were conscientious enough to save. So anyways, Pinocchio is transformed into a victim, and he's offered this, he's offered this identity, and he takes it. Now, it's partly because he's deceived and, and manipulated, but it's also partly because the fox offers him the abandonment of responsibility as payment for, as payment for adopting the victim identity. So, this is where his own lack of morality, let's say, because this is all about Pinocchio's development as a character, plays a role in his demise. So, if I'm a victim, then everyone else owes me something, and I don't have to take any responsibility. And so, one of the things I've wondered, here's something to think about. It might be that the sense of meaning that life can provide to you is proportionate to the amount of responsibility you decide to take on. Not, that'd be very strange if it was the case, you know, because responsibility, of course, is a kind of weight, obviously. And it's difficult to take on responsibility. But if any positive emotion that you feel, and your control of anxiety, and the control over pain, is dependent on the activation of these systems that watch you move towards a desired goal, then the more complete and weighty the goal is, the more kick there's going to be in the observation that you're moving towards it. And, I, you know, you kind of already know this, because You'll, you'll have observed in your own life that when you're engaged in something that you believe in that the time passes properly you know, you can see this even if you're maybe you're reading a paper and it's actually related in some intelligible manner to something that you want to learn so even though it's difficult, you get engaged in it, you can remember it better, you can process it better and you don't 
you're not so likely to fall asleep and you're not so likely to want to find distractions, all of that, you can get into it and it would be very interesting if that was proportionate to the degree of responsibility that you're willing to shoulder and I, I think you can make a strong case for that I've also often wondered imagine you could offer people a choice here's the choice, you could say, well your life isn't meaningful, the nihilists have got it right, there's no meaning in your life and because of that, there's no reason for you to accept any responsibility so you can live a responsibility-free life, and maybe one of impulsive pleasure-seeking, but a responsibility-free life, but the price you pay is that it doesn't get to be meaningful. Or you could say to someone, no, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to say, you can live a meaningful life, but it's only going to be as meaningful as the amount of responsibility that you're willing to bear. And then you might say, well, what would people choose? Because everybody also always makes noises about wanting to have a meaningful life. But if the price you pay for that is the adoption of responsibility, then it's not so obvious that people would choose meaning over, you know, over pointless pursuits if they had to, if the benefit they got for choosing the pointless pursuits was that they really didn't have to care about anything they ever did, right? There's no responsibility. And that's really what Pinocchio is offered. And that's what the coachman offers him. And that's interesting because, you know, so far it's been the fox and the and the cat, and they're kind of two-bit hoods, and so the pathological pathway that they offer Pinocchio is not the worst of the pathological pathways, but here, at least as far as the imagination, the collective imagination that created this movie is concerned, is this is where you get to the most pathological form of, let's call it temptation, and that's the temptation to engage in, to abandon responsibility and to engage in impulsive pleasure-seeking short-term pleasure-seeking, so here's the fox pretending to be a doctor investigating um, Pinocchio's illness and he makes some notes which is all just meaningless scribble, right, it's like white noise and it doesn't matter that the arguments that he's making is, are completely incoherent and it doesn't matter that he actually doesn't know anything, he, what he's selling is easy to buy and so Pinocchio buys it and by the end of the conversation with the fox, he's pretty convinced that he's useless and that he needs a vacation. You know, this is an edible, an edible situation as well, which I touched on in the other lecture. I mean, it's fair, let's imagine that you have a child that is a little on the neurotic side, so high negative emotion, and maybe one that's also a little bit on the sickly side, so has a variety of let's say relatively minor ailments, but ailments nonetheless and so what that means as a parent, we'll say mother for this example because I want to use the Oedipal example you have to make a decision all the time about exactly how you're going to treat that child one decision is, well I'm not going to, you don't have to go to school today because you're not feeling well it's like, fair enough but do you make the same decision the next day? and do you make the same decision the next day, and let's imagine that you enable the child to avoid responsibility as a consequence of capitalizing on their illness well then that's not going to be very good for the child, the rule with an, a sickly child has to be something like I'm going to push you right to your limit because otherwise, how is the person going to figure out what they can do? and if they can't figure out what they, they can do, then they're not going to be able to make their way in the world at all and then that gets muddied very badly if you're not exactly sure that you want them to make their way in the world, you know maybe you're just as happy because you'd be sitting at home alone if your child was there with you and maybe you'd be just as happy at some level if they never grew up at all because then they won't leave and so, and maybe that's because you have a terrible marriage and you're lonesome, you know maybe it's an abusive marriage and your husband has chased away all your friends and so you don't have anything at all and maybe that's because you didn't stand up for yourself very well apart from the fact that he was, you know, tyrannical in his central nature and so then, all those little warps and bends in your psyche are going to manifest themselves right, right in the background of every single one of those decisions my daughter had a lot of illnesses when she was uh, adolescent and they were very serious and it was very difficult to figure out what to do about that because you, you, you couldn't exactly apply normative rules, right? And we always had to figure out if she was 
communicating her symptoms to us, how seriously to take those. And the answer was, the least amount of serious possible. It's something like that, because we needed to know, and she needed to know, what she could do in spite of the fact that she had problems. And one of the things I really tried to instill in her, and I think it worked, is that you don't ever want to use it, your illness as an excuse for not doing anything. Not consciously. You know, sometimes you might not know, I'm not feeling well, How, what can I do? Well, you don't know, right? Because sometimes when you're not feeling well, you can do more than you think, and sometimes you can do less than you think. It's not like it's obvious. But sometimes it's obvious, you know, this little temptation flits through your mind and you think, well, I don't really want to do what I'm doing today and I'm not feeling very well, so I don't have to do it. You do that a hundred times, then you don't know how sick you are anymore. And then you're, then you're in real trouble, because not only are you sick, but you actually have, you've muddied the waters. And so you have both problems then, is you're actually ill and you've betrayed yourself by using that as an excuse not to pursue your responsibilities. And that, I think, if you do both of them, if those, both of those things happen to you at the same time, you're in real trouble. And it's really hard not to have that happen. 